Someone once said, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Meaning something that may seem broken or worthless could actually be a priceless gem. This is the story of us and Jesus. When reading the Gospel of Luke, we can witness the transformative power of Jesus on every page. We can see that nothing is too broken for Jesus to heal, and no one is worthless. All who believed in the Savior were restored. Jesus built his church on the faith of willing misfits who thought their story was over when it was only beginning. This invitation remains as true today as it was in the first century. Nothing is too broken. No one is worthless. And all who call on the name of Jesus can begin again. Will you join me in welcoming our guests that are tuning in from around the country and around the world? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Let's give it up for the mighty men of Transformation Church, Kershaw and Lee Correctional Institutions, and the beautiful women of Camille Correctional Institution, and to our guests here at Transformation Church 520. One, thank you so much. So we are continuing our series, You Can Begin Again, and we've got a mini series within the larger series as we've followed Jesus in the wilderness. And we learned something. We learned that in the wilderness, it's important for us to surrender. And when we surrender to God, we're not surrendering to someone that's hostile. We're surrendering to a father that loves us. One of the problems of being made in the image of God is we often think that we are God. And because we think that we are God, and I'm speaking to Christians first, and I'm speaking to those of you who are yet to follow Christ, but oftentimes for Christians, it's like, Jesus, well, thank you for what you did. I'll take it from here. For those of you who are yet to discover Christ, you're only doing what you know to do, and that's the best that you can. And Jesus is saying, don't do the best that you can. Let me be your best so that you can. Did y'all catch that? Let me be your best so that you can. That's why it's called Christianity, total reliance, but surrendering is difficult. I think it's easier to surrender to fear and bullying and hostility than it is to surrender to love. And here's why. With bullying and hostility, you're surrendering to an enemy, and you, but you're still holding back. To surrender to love means here's all of me. He, here's everything about me. And if we're really honest, we don't really want everybody to know everything about us. But here's the thing. God already knows about us. He just wants us to be honest about who we are. And God says, bring whatever it is to me, I can handle it. My grace is sufficient, but we've got to surrender. Now, for the last couple of weeks, we've looked at the attacks of the evil one. There are dark, demonic forces in the world. If you don't believe that, just turn on the TV. Let's look at some of our family relationships. There is a dark, demonic world. Teenagers, there is a dark, demonic world that wants to destroy you. But the enemy has used... Three temptations from the Garden of Eden with the children of Israel in the wilderness to even right now in this moment. Temptation number one is this. I am what I do, our performance-based living. I am what I do. I am what I do. That's very insidious. I am what I do. So instead of building our lives on Jesus being the rock, we build our lives on the sand of what we accomplish. Now, to be a follower of Christ doesn't mean that you throw your brains away. Your performance is important. You know, I don't want you showing up at work and going, you know, Pastor Dermot said my performance doesn't matter, so I still want a paycheck. Or teenagers, I don't want you looking at your parents like, you know, Pastor Derwin said performance doesn't matter, so I failed all my classes, but Jesus loves me. <laughs> Here's the difference. Am I performing out of the overflow of God's love and acceptance, or am I performing for God's love and acceptance? One is idolatry, the other 
is worship. So we are not what we do. We are what Christ has done. That's hard. That requires us to get rid of ego, edging God out. Requires us to surrender to love. So where do we get this from? Let's look at the first temptation when Jesus was in the wilderness. Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. And I hope and I pray that you are reading along this entire month. We as a church are reading along through the gospel of Luke. I hope and pray that you are reading the Bible. I want you to know, and I'm saying this with love, so hear my heart. If you come to me for pastoral counseling, pastoral care, I'm going to ask you, are you reading the Bible? Are you talking to Jesus? Because he is infinitely more powerful than preacher man here. I can't help you. I can only point you to the great healer himself. If you got time for Facebook, you got time for the good book. If you got time for Snapchat, you got time for the good book. If you got time for Instagram, you got time for the Bible. If you took all of your time and seen how much of it you could be spending with God. So don't expect me to put on a cape because I don't have one. But I know somebody who carried a cross. And in the Gospel of Luke, you can talk to him. And he doesn't lose his wallet like I do. (laughs) Then Jesus left for the Jordan, full of the Holy Spirit, and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and when they were over, he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, it is written, man must not live by bread alone. I want to encourage you, please, please, please listen to sermon number one and number two in this mini series to understand that Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Think about this. If Jesus quoted scripture, how much more should we quote scripture? Now, I know what you're thinking. You're going, but pastor, that's Jesus. Remember, Jesus in his humanity, he's 100% a human being. He's the prototype. Every temptation we've ever experienced, Jesus has experienced, but he walked in the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't just make Jesus divine and miss his humanity. That's, by the way, that's a theological heresy, and we don't want to be heretics, okay? If you don't want Jesus to be human, let's just end Christmas. Christmas is celebrating that God became one of us. In order for Jesus to be the ultimate sacrifice, he has to be one of us. So every temptation you've experienced, Jesus has experienced. Men, Jesus has experienced every temptation you've experienced. He had a good reputation, I suspect. He was a carpenter, worked with his hands. I'm sure the Jewish girls are like, that man will pay bills on time. I'm going to get him. Let's look at temptation number two. I am what I have possessions. In the United States of America, it's whoever has the most toys wins. <laughs> but here's something though. Have you ever seen a U-Haul following a hearst? Let me say that again. Have you ever seen a U-Haul following a hearst? No. So you can't take what you got. Is there anything wrong with having possessions? No, but everything is wrong when the possessions have you. Success is often measured by what we possess, and Jesus is saying success is me possessing you because if possessions drive you, there's this insidious spiritual cancer called greed that will infect you. And what do greedy people do? They take advantage of other people for their own gain. And that's not just rich, that's just not poor. It's a state of the heart. Because growing up in the hood, there was all types of con games going on. All types of con games at every level. So it's not just a rich thing, it's a heart thing. We wanna be possessed by Christ not possessed by the things that we have. In other words, don't worship the good gifts God gives you. Worship the good giver himself. Let's move to temptation number three after we read this text. So he took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. The devil said to him, I will give you their splendor and all this authority because it has been given over to me and I can give it to anyone I want. If you then will worship me, All will be yours. And Jesus answered him, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So where did Jesus get this from? It's written. This is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 10 through 13. 
Let's look at temptation number three. Teenagers, check this out. Temptations number three. I am what others think popularity. I am what others think popularity. Let me pause here. All of us, from a very, very early age, have been influenced by what others think. I mean, I remember in elementary school, there was a certain group of people I wanted to be with. In middle school, there was a certain group of people I wanted to be with. In high school, there was a certain group of people I wanted to be with. I was a compulsive stutterer, so I didn't really talk a lot, but I had like one friend. We literally would get in this car, drive around San Antonio, a big old loop, 410, we'd drive around, wouldn't say a word, he'd drop me off at home, and I'd say, see you tomorrow. <laughs> we all want to be in an in group. We, we, we all want to be known. But the problem is this, is this can present immense problems when what people say to us becomes stronger than what Jesus says to us. So let's dive into the text and walk through it. Verse 9. This is the devil. So he took him to Jerusalem. Let me pause here. Jesus was a Jew. First century, second temple Jewish time. This is a big deal. He had, he had him stand on the pinnacle of the t- temple. Recently when I was in Israel, I could see right where Satan would have had Christ. And he's, he has him there to look over the holy city where the presence of God was. And he's offering him everything. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you. Notice what Satan did. It is written. The evil one and his demonic henchmen know the Bible too. So how much more do you need to know the Bible? He will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you, and they will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. So notice this, Jesus, let everybody know who you are. Let the angels come. Do you notice when Jesus does a healing, particularly early in his ministry, what does he say? Shh, don't tell anybody. Be, 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 don't, shh, be quiet. Now, I'm not saying what I'm about to say next. I'm not saying get rid of social media and what I'm about to say, but I don't think Jesus would have had an Instagram account. I don't think he'd have Twitter. Uh, I don't think he would have had Facebook because Jesus was very, very secure in what his daddy spoke over him. And so the affirmation of people is not what drove Jesus. Do you know how many people wanted Jesus to do things? But he had a mission and a focus, and the opinions of people did not deter him from that. And Jesus answered him, it is said, do not test the Lord your God. He's quoting Deuteronomy 6, verse 14. After the devil had finished every temptation, he departed from him for a time. All right, so let's dive right into it. Some of us are addicted to what others think about us. Some of us are addicted to what others think about us. And as a result, here's three things that can happen. Number one, many of us put a higher value on what others think about us than what Jesus thinks about us. Many of us put a higher value on what others think about us than what Jesus thinks about us. Now let me pause here. Let me... Because of culture, uh, let me do some pre-work here. Let me break down some strongholds, okay? Now, if you're under 25, this is really, really important. Just because someone doesn't agree with you doesn't mean they're hating on you. So, for example, if you came to me and said, Pastor Derwin, God has given me a dream. I'd be like, "Woo! let me hear it. I'm going to sing on American Idol. I'm going to be a musician. I'll go, okay, let me hear you sing. And then you get up and sound like a goat. (laughs) It would be sin for me to go, do that. (laughs) It's not hating on someone to go, you really may want to consider that. And here's why. In America, we believe this lie. You can be anything you want to be. That's not true. You can be everything God has created you to be. 
which is so much better than you can be anything you want to be. Because anything that you, if I was left to my own devices to be everything I wanted to be, I would be so selfish and care just about me. But when you want to be what God wants you to be, that changes the story. So someone's not hating on you if they don't agree with you or if they don't support your idea or this one. You know, Pastor Derwin, you know, when I was about 14, man, I just, I just liked women. I just liked a lot of them, and I got married, and I still liked them. So I was born that way, Pastor, so it's wrong of you to take away my God-given delight because I was born that way, to have an affair. Friends, we're all born messed up. That's why we need to be born again. Wait, I don't know if y'all caught that. Christianity is not your bad Jesus makes you do good. Christianity is you're dead in need of a spiritual resurrection. We're all born dead and need to be born again. We're all born messed up. That's why Jesus enters our mess. So when I say many of us put a higher value on what others think about us than what Jesus thinks about us, I'm not endorsing, well, I'm, forget what you say, what Jesus says. No, what Jesus wants is a life that's transformed. It's true. God loves you right where you are, but his love won't leave you the same. God loves you right where you are, but his love won't leave you the same. The love of God is a transformative love. The love of God is one that transforms you. To use Pauline language in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, his love takes you from glory to glory. In other words, he makes you more like Jesus as Jesus plants himself in you. You understand what I'm saying? His love will not leave us where we are. So many of us put a higher value on what others think about us than what Jesus thinks about us. Let me talk to the teenage young ladies, 7th, 8th grade and up. How long are you going to let other teenage girls rent space in your mind for free? You're thinking about, oh, what well, she said this, and she put this on Snapchat, and she put this on Instagram. Ah! I, just, I want her to fall into a black hole. And you're just, you're just thinking, think, 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 think about it. They win. All you're doing is thinking about them. You know what the Bible calls that? Idolatry. When you're thinking more about what somebody else thinks about you than what Jesus thinks about you, you're worshiping them. Think about how you could be using that time to think about what Jesus thinks about you. But here's the thing, though. You can't know what Jesus thinks about you if you don't spend time with Jesus. It's hard to know what Jesus thinks about you if you don't spend time with him. But think about how much time we spend thinking about what other people have done for you. Guys, I get it, man. I get it. My dad lived three blocks from me. Three blocks. He never came over. He never went to any of my games. He never showed up. And for years, I used that as fuel. But here's the problem. When you use bitterness for fuel, guess who gets burned up on the inside? You do. I do. That doesn't help. You know what changes the heart? Is I choose to dwell on Jesus saying, hey, Derwin, I know your father abandoned you, but my daddy loves taking in orphans. Hey, Derwin, there's never not been a day that my daddy has not thought about you. Guys, it's not out here that changes you. God changes you from the inside out. When we think about what God thinks about us more than what other people thinks about us, guess who gets changed? We do. Number two, our self-image soars with a compliment and is devastated by a criticism. That's one of the ways you know that you're addicted to the popularity or to the opinions of others. If somebody gives you a compliment, boom, you soar. If you get a criticism, you decrease. Now, ladies, let me talk, talk to you. If you're single, you know, 15, 16, whatever, and, and up. If you are single, one of the surest ways to ensure that you will attract, notice I'm about to say, a godly, healthy man. Notice what I said. A godly, healthy man. He may not be the finest man, but he will be godly and healthy. And by the way, teenage girls, I know I get it. You're like, oh, but pastor, he's so fine. His hair, he's got abs. Oh, my gosh. That's going to last from 17 to 30, then it's over. 
Look around. Look. Look around. I'm telling you, teenagers, your dad was fine at one time. And then something happens. It's called 30. Hey, ladies, you got to learn to make a long-term investment. Hold on, hold on, wait. I don't think you heard me, though. Ladies, you got to learn to make a long-term investment. And one of the ways to ensure that you can draw a spiritually healthy, emotionally mature, godly man is that your self-image is first rooted in the love of God. Because when God is your affirmation, you don't listen to the nonsense of a wackadoo. Hey, baby, shoes. Girl, you know you looking good. Shoes. And you're like... Well, thank you very much, but my father already told me I'm wonderfully and fearfully made since my mother's womb. All right, God, I'm, I'm trying to help you here. I'm, I'm trying to help you. So I don't know if you noticed, but I quote a lot of scripture. I, I, let me say that again. I hope you notice I quote a lot of scripture. The scene of the crime is your mind. And we get devastated by criticism. Man. I remember early on preaching like God could do amazing things. Like we'd have baptisms that would last for hours, people getting baptized. I'll get one email that's critical and I'll be like, Vicki. <laughs> now, I'm the soft one in our family. The one you need to watch out for is Vicki. Like I'm like the emotional one. I just want to talk. Can we hold each other? She's like, you still reading that e email? Are, are, are you still reading that? So now, if it's true, repent and be changed. If it's not, ignore it. Because misery loves company. Our self-image soars with a compliment and is devastated by a criticism. Oh, let me, let me pause there. This is really important. Uh, if you're under 35, okay? If you're at 35, you're good too. <laughs> I'm black. You can talk back to me. It's cool. All right. <laughs> so, so please understand say this. In order for you to grow, you've got to be corrected. One of the great things about team sports, particularly if the coaches use coaching to model and shape young student athletes, it's, a, it's really important. Criticism, when it's done right, is always to build. But when your ego is so fragile, you can never improve because you're worried about somebody hating on you. They're loving you. They're criticizing you. Some of the best coaches I had were the most difficult because they saw greatness in me. They wanted me to be disciplined and to be focused. When you get to the NFL, they're not like, Derwin, now I know your emotions are fragile, son. But on this particular play, you just dropped the ball. No, you know what that coach is thinking? Derwin, I got a kid in college. I got a mortgage. I got a wife to take care of. And you are paying my bills by how you play. So I'm going to coach you the way you need to be coached so you can execute. So you can get paid. I can get paid. And all y'all won't be Monday morning quarterbacks tweeting about what we should have done. <laughs> by the way, they have football tryouts every spring if you're interested in taking Cam Newton's place. Some of y'all be like, Cam Newton, shit. shut up. <laughs> you, you get the ball, ah, you, man, talking about what you'll do. Hey, they got trials every spring. But the point is, when you're secure in Christ, criticism becomes a means of growth, not people are hating on you. That's like getting a test back going, oh, it's multiple choice and I picked the wrong one. You're hating on me. All right, number three, you get the point. All right, here we go. Number three, we live as a false self when we're addicted to people's opinions. Why? Because we'll be characterized by fear. Man, this is a big white flag for me. I had to surrender this. I love people, and you know what I would used to do because of fear? Let me give you the scenario early on. Leading Transformation Church, things are exciting. God, thank you for using me. And people go, Pastor, can we meet? Yeah, we'll meet. Pastor, can we meet? Yeah, we'll meet. Pastor, can we meet? Yeah, we'll meet. Ten times in one day. And I'll be like, 
oh, I'm going to have to let them know I can't meet. And then that makes them mad because I told them I could meet with them. But I was too afraid to go, you know what, why don't you send me an email and maybe we can meet. You know, or, Pastor, I want you to do my wedding. Pastor, I want you to do this. Pastor, I want you to do that. And it's like, no, I, I, I can't do all that. That's, that's how a cult gets started. When you think like one person has the Holy Spirit's power. There are so many gifted, spirit-filled leaders at Transformation Church. But I was struggling with, well, I don't want people not to like me. Oh, the church is growing, so you too big time. No, I got a wife. Well, I want you to mentor my kids. I got my own kids. <laughs> well, I want you to do this. What, you don't think I need rest? So this is what will happen. You live with this fear of letting people down. And I finally got to the point a few years ago where I had to surrender to the love of God and say, I would rather let people down and disappoint them than to neglect my wife and kids and my own health. Now, here's what's interesting. Some of you will get it, some of you won't. Protestant evangelical Christians say they don't want a pope until they need Derwin to do something. Then I'm the only one that can do it. I'm not a pope, guys. I'm a follower of Christ just like you. And that's why we have an incredible team that has set me free. But also others have developed and matured. And I suspect, I suspect there are many people pleasers among us like I was. And you are overextended. You are overextended. And not only is there fear, there's anger. You're angry because you said yes, because you and I didn't have the courage to have boundaries to say no. And you're burned out and you're tired. Matter of fact, some of you moms, what are y'all doing? Man, you're trying to do everything. What was that commercial back in the day? Bring home the bacon, fry it up in a pan. Y'all, y'all, y'all remember that? Anybody that's old remember that commercial? It's like, no, don't believe that lie. Like, don't try to do everything. Just do what God calls you to do. So there's fear. And then there's manipulation. You have to manipulate the relationship because you want people to like you. And with manipulation, nothing ever comes good from that. You got to lie. You have to be something that you're not. And then there's possessiveness. Because I'm relying on you for my identity by what you say, I have to possess you. By the way, that's never a good relationship. That's a vampire relationship. It's not that I really love you because you're made in the image of God. I'm using you to meet my emotional need. That's not a friendship. And that's the way most friendships are. And that's why a lot of relationships don't make it. Listen, only Jesus can meet Vicky's deepest emotional needs. I can't. I'm just a dude. Only Jesus can meet my deepest emotional needs needs. Vicky's just a girl. But when we allow Jesus to meet our needs, we begin to become conduits of grace through Jesus for one another. There's a lot of folks who get married like, oh, she's going to save me. No, she ain't. <laughs> oh, he's going to save me. That's until about six years into the marriage, he gained some weight and starts snoring. We began to possess people. And in their self-promotion, often the most confident among us are actually the least confident. That I have to broadcast who I am so people will like me and love me. Now, don't get me wrong. Should, should, should we announce things and celebrate those things? Here's the thing, though. But what's in your heart? Do you post or announce something for somebody to meet a need, or are you announcing something because God has been good? They could look the same, but have very, very different aspects. So, so teenagers, be very careful. You live in an era that us old folks are just now experiencing. Like you guys, like you guys have always had remote control TVs. <laughs> like you guys have had things. Like you were born on social media, which is a way to become an idolater big time. Like you want somebody to meet your needs and put out a, a post about how bad, how, how bad you feel and everybody will rush. Hey, here's a thought. Here's a thought. Instead of posting how bad you feel, open up your Bible and talk to Jesus. 
Now, if I didn't love you, I'd make up some spiritual hoo-ha right now because it's easy to go somewhere else and hear some other stuff that's contrary to that. My desire here is to be faithful, not to give you cotton candy, but to tell you the truth. Open up your Bible and let Jesus speak to you. He'll meet your deepest, deepest needs. And then finally, it'll ultimately lead to self-destructiveness. It'll ultimately lead to self-destructiveness. So teenagers, how do we overcome temptation number three? By faith. Faith is, is trust. Um, I'm convinced that one of the greatest needs in the body of Christ is faith. Now, it's interesting. Our, everybody, everybody, everybody stop writing. This is really important. I, I'm, I'm glad you're writing. I love that. This is important. Everybody here, look me in the eyes. In order to look everybody in the eyes, I got to look right into the red dot, okay? So, so check, check this out. I think our biggest issue is faith. It's, it's trusting God when I can't see it, taste it, feel it, but not trusting God just to heal me when I'm sick. Not trusting God to just heal me when I need a new job, but trusting God to make me more like Jesus. I mean, what if our heart's cry was, God, I want faith to be like Jesus. Now, you know, why is it that we get email chains when people are sick, but not email chains for the body of Christ, which is sick, not to reflect Christ? A lot of what we're doing is magic. It's not even faith. It's magic. Well, God, if I do this incantation, I'll get, get this. And God is saying, I want to give you me. Like, obedience is a, is a transaction of my life with your life where you become more like the life of my son. So by faith, daily let your inner security and worth be found in the Abba's love. Abba is an Aramaic word for, for father. It, 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 it means daddy, intimacy you see. God is saying, I want you to look into me. And the clearest picture of God the Father we could ever get is Jesus. You want to know what God the Father's like? Look at Jesus. He is the mirror of God the Father, the exact representation of him. So we want our inner security not to be found in the opinions of people, but in what God says, our inner security and our worth. When Jesus was baptized... This is what took place. When all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized. He was praying and heaven opened. And the Holy Spirit descended on him in a physical appearance like a dove. Listen to this. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Teenagers, here's why this is important. If you're not yet a follower of Christ, man, God is inviting you into the greatest story of all stories. Listen to this now. This is the most important thing I could ever teach. When you and I come to the grips, when you and I get our white flags and we say, God, I'm, I am surrendering, I am surrendering, and we say yes to Jesus forgiving us, we say yes to Jesus raising from the dead, a supernatural bonding take place. Theologians call it union life in Christ. The apostle Paul called it in Christ. And it means this, that when you say yes to Jesus, not only are you forgiven, not only are you made new, but for all eternity on, when God the Father looks at you, he says, you are my beloved and I am well pleased with you. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're going, but pastor, how can God think that about me? Does he not know what I've done? Not only does he know what you and I have done, not only does he know what you and I have done, but with a booming voice, he wants you to know what his son has done to eclipse and swallow up what you've done. You see, our view of Jesus is way too small. He's done more than forgiveness. He said, what my son is, you are too. And God wants us to believe it. That will change your life. That will make you different. That will break generational curses. <laughs> Never see yourself separate from Jesus. Now, here's the hard part, though. Because we're made in the image of God, we often want to be God. In order to live that kind of life, you've got to say, I'm weak and I can't do it. I'm weak and I can't do it. Christianity is not for strong people. It's for weak people. Surrender. And by the way, when you realize you're weak, you'll be as strong as you've ever thought you could be. 
Why? Because Jesus becomes your strength. Last verse. The Apostle Paul says this, and because you are sons and daughters, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. One of the reasons why we believe that God is Father, Son, and Spirit is because of scriptures like this, God, Spirit, Son, Father, Son, Spirit. God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit in you, the life of Jesus is in you, God the Father's in you, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave for the sermon's purposes. You're no longer a slave to what somebody said to you a long time ago. Can, can, can I have a mo moment to just testify a minute? Because I don't know if you know this, like, they say I'm a preacher, uh, but I'm, I'm just talking out of the overflow of what God's done for me. And if you get something out of it, awesome. I think it's working so far. So when I was about nine, um, I was running around the house like I did watching football. I'll never forget, we're watching the Houston Oilers. This is back in the day. And I was running around nine years old with a ball. Still to this day, I got footballs all over. I got like nine footballs at the house. It's ridiculous. And I had on my Fruit of Loon underwear. And I'm running around with the ball, and we're watching the Houston Oilers. And on TV, the announcers are talking about football contracts. So I run, I grab some paper, and I write it up. And my grandfather at this time of his life, uh, I was just, he had seen so many of the men in our family go down the wrong road, and he was just tired. He didn't know the Lord. He was tired. So I forgive him. Here's why. So here I am, a little boy, nine years old, fruit loon underwear with my football with some paper. And I hand it to him. I said, Grandpa, let's sign a contract to play with the Oilers. And he looked at me. I'm a, I'm a little boy, and he goes, people like you just dream. Now, there was revenge in my heart when I signed my first contract, when I signed my second one, and when I signed my third one. But revenge is never good. Forgiveness is. So just because I signed the contract doesn't mean I made it. Love is making it. Forgiveness is making it. You know, the things Jesus cared about. But he said those words to me, and I'm sure you've had words spoken over you that still haunt you today. I've got some really good news. God the Father speaks a word over you, and he says, you're no longer a slave to those words, but you're set free in my son to God's word that says, you are my beloved son and daughter. Now, here's the deal. God isn't goofy and neither am I. God's unconditional love for you is not based on what you've done or what I've done, but based on what my son, what his son has done. And the more you realize what Jesus has done for you, the more your behavior will get in alignment with what God the Father says about you. Did y'all catch that? So belief leads to transformation. What we think is, I'm going to act my way to somebody else. No, no. God is going to do it through Christ. He speaks a word over you. And if a son, then God has made you an heir. So here's our soul tattoo. Uh, we're going to receive communion. And KJ is going to come out and sing a song here. And we're going to allow that time to really be a time for God to deal with us. So surrender whatever it is that you need to surrender. But we want God's voice to be what we live from. His affirmation to be what we live from. Now, before we receive communion, I want to pray for those who are yet to follow Jesus. So will you pray with me? Father, I want to thank you for these precious people. I want to thank you that you want to love them with your Abba love. I want to pray right now for those of you who are saying, uh, Pastor Derwin, man, I'm ready to surrender. I'm tired. Maybe you're a teenager. Maybe you're a preteen. Maybe you are an older. I don't know. But you're saying, I'm tired, I'm ready. If you're ready to surrender to Jesus, if, if you're ready to be born again, if you're ready to have a new start, you're ready to be forgiven, you're ready to be his dwelling place, to become a part of his family, if you're ready to enter into his kingdom, 
in the silence of your heart right now, say this to him. Today, Lord Jesus, I take hold of this gift. By faith, I believe that on that bloody cross, you took my place, you were disgraced to give me grace. I believe that three days later, you rose from the dead, and I'm now a dwelling place of your spirit. I'm now a part of your family. I can begin again. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So as our hospitality team hands out the elements, uh, don't, re- don't eat the bread or drink the juice yet because we're going to do that together. So we got a, a few things that's happening, okay? Uh, you got to coordinate to make sure you don't drop the bread or the juice. But I also want you to listen to the words of this song because you're not surrendering to an enemy You're surrendering to an Abba that loves you. When I heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I heard tender whisper. In the dead of night, you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. To I am Oh, and I worship Many searching for it Far and wide, oh, but I We're all searching for answers Only you provide Because you Oh, just what we Say a word, you're a good, good father. That's who you are. That's who you are. That's who you are. And I'm loved by you. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. You're a good, good father. Sing it out. That's who you are. That's who you are. Who you are, and I'm loved by you. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. Sing that out, church. You're perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To always love so undeniable. I can hardly speak its peace so unexplainable I, I can hardly think as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still into love love
sing you're perfect. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To us. Sing a good father. You're a good, good father. That's who you are. That's who you are. That's who you are. And I will love I to I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. So the night that our Lord was betrayed, it was a Passover night. And he had done it with his disciples two other times, but this time it was different. He, he took bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. Now I want you to think about this for a moment. Jesus, the eternal son of God, 100% man, 100% God the Son says, I, I am broken for you. So let's kick it up a notch. One of the first values here at Transformation Church, the first value is a high and lofty view of God because the greater that we perceive God, the greater we appreciate his grace. So this Jesus, whom the book of Isaiah describes in Isaiah chapter 6, it says that, all the angels could do was sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That Jesus was broken for you. The same Jesus who called the universe into being was broken for you. How much are you worth to him? Like whatever affirmation you are looking for, find it right here in this sacred symbol God saying, I have been broken for you. So, so how beautiful. Jesus is broken to heal our brokenness. Let us receive the body of our Lord together. Thank you, Lord Jesus. May our souls be forever tattooed with what you say about us, that we are sons and daughters of your papa. We are loved. Amen. And next, Jesus took wine and he said, this is my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Now, it was over Passover weekend. And so for a Jewish person, there's two incredible things that are happening. As a matter of fact, Jewish people around the world on Friday celebrated Yom Kippur. That's the day of atonement. That's the day in which for contemporary Jews that the book of heaven would be opened up and sins could be forgiven that one time for the year. Out of respect for my Jewish brothers and sisters and friends, isn't it good news to know that the Lamb's book of life ain't just open up one time a year, it is eternally open and the blood of the Lamb has opened it. That we live in a continual Yom Kippur. Matter of fact, we live in an ocean of forgiveness. So when Jesus said, this is my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins, it would have been, not only are you forgiven, but the imagery of Passover, the blood over the door liberates us from captivity. So it's not just forgiveness you're receiving, but you are receiving power. There is power in the blood of Jesus. Let me say it one more time. There is power in the blood of Jesus for you. Teenagers, not just forgiveness, but power. Let us receive the, body, the blood of our Lord. Father, we thank you that you speak over us the words that you spoke over your son. You are my beloved sons and daughters in whom I'm well pleased. And the more that we believe your words of affirmation, the more our lives become in alignment with what you say about us. You love us where we are, but you don't love us to leave us the same. That love is a transformative love. Father, may we listen to your voice above every other voice. It's in your glorious name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Can we give God a round of applause?